Um, you did mention earlier that you kind of had like an entrepreneurial spirit or you grew up very entrepreneurial. My very first job, I was 14. I was selling newspapers. Um, that was like 13, 14. That was like my first job. So I would say that was the very first time like I started working for my own self. Uh, in high school, I used to sell candy. Uh, hit up Costco, we get the, you know, bundle pack, get back to the school. Uh, yeah, like, ever since then, I've, I've always known I wanted to own my business. It was more like finding what the right opportunity looked like. Before the cut, like, the very first app I built was more for, like, <clears throat> financial planning. So for you as someone who's working a job, um, you know your salary, you know how much you get paid hourly, and you can put this information to the app that we can kind of like forecast how much you should save um, and what that will compound to over time. So like you can help plan for a time. And yeah, like I've always, like I said, wanted to like, my whole thing has always been around solving problems. I know I've always like solving problems for people and, you know, usually you can know, do that in a business format. So that's kind of, I've been Welcome to the Friends in Beauty podcast, a safe space for ambitious beauty industry creatives to have real talk, get authentic answers and practical tools to grow their businesses. Join me every week as me and my special guest reveal the keys to longevity and success in the beauty industry from the ups and downs of their journey to the nitty gritty of their struggles and triumphs. We're spilling the tea on it all and most importantly, having fun while doing it. You ready? Hey, what's up? It's your best friend in beauty, Aquia Robinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Friends in Beauty podcast. I'm so happy to have you here, and I hope you're listening to this episode in high spirits and in good health. Now, on today's episode of the Friends in Beauty podcast, I welcome Obi Omile, the co-founder of the Cut app. And the Cut app is an app that helps you find dope barbers anywhere in the world. And he's also a Forbes 30 under 30 in consumer tech. So that is just the dopest thing ever. Welcome to the Friends of Beauty podcast, Obi. Thank you so much for having me, Aquia. And thank you so much for everyone who's tuned in and listening. Like, I look forward to talking and meeting the rest of the community and, you know, just having a fun conversation. Yeah, this is going to be really, really fun because, as you know, I've had the pleasure of attending two of your events within like the last, you know, few weeks and learning more about the Cut app, oh. about, you know, the advocacy work that you're doing for the industry and everything. So I'm excited to have this conversation today. Same. Me too. Can't wait. Yes. Before we jump into it, let's start off with some icebreakers so the Friends of Beauty audience can get to know you a little bit outside of what you do for your brand. Okay, okay, okay. So first one, just give us three random facts about you. Three random facts. Oh, man. Uh, I love to travel. Okay. Um, I like riding horses and I met President Obama once. Oh, okay. How did that happen? Shout out to my man's Barry. How did that happen? Um, I so <clears throat> my university he came to speak at um when I was in college, and our professor got to select like a few of us in the economics class to go and like sit in on the conversation at the university. And yeah, I was one of the selected few, and yeah, I got a chance to go watch him speak. They lined us up. He came by, he shaked everyone's hands. It lasted about fourteen seconds, but it was still. <laughs> I love, that. I love that. What school did you go to? Uh, James Madison. James Madison. Okay. Cool. I've met somebody from there before, some years ago. I, was, I never heard of it until I had met that girl, James Madison University. Yeah, we got okay. a nice little city. Go Dukes. Oh, nice, nice. Okay. I saw that you like to travel as well. Like, what is one, like, maybe your top three travel destinations that you've been to? <sighs> top three. Uh, I would say Costa Rica. Okay. Brazil and um the toss up between Colombia and uh Japan. Oh, Japan. Ooh. Okay. I when I was younger in high school, my uh, my uncle actually moved to Japan and married a Japanese woman. So I was like a like I have Japanese cousin. So we got to go meet him when I was in high school. Definitely want to go back as an adult though. Cause Okay. I've always wanted to go to Japan for some reason. I don't know. No, I mean it's dope. And like like they they are really um at least they seem to really uh admire like African American black culture. Um mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's definitely it's like, I feel like it'll be a lot of fun in Japan. Um, 
But you definitely want to go back as an adult for sure. Okay. Okay. What do people always tell you that you're good at aside from what you're doing business wise? Hmm. What do people tell me that I'm good at? People probably uh, one of two things. Um, I'm good at having a good time, fun at okay. like, you know, livening up any situation. Uh, people tell me I could be a comedian or do stand up. I don't know if I believe it, but, <laughs> you know, like, you know. Well, now you're going to give us a knock knock joke. Yeah, no, nah, it's not happening. You know, it's, it's definitely more of like the Kevin Hart type of funny where it's like situational, but you know, maybe in another life, maybe in another life. You know, the thing that I think a lot of people don't know about me too is like, I'm really funny, okay. but because I'm quiet, what mm -hmm. tends to happen is like my friend beside me or the person beside me will steal my joke and like say it out loud and everybody's laughing. And they don't even give me credit. I'm like, that's, that's crazy. They don't give you credit. They at least give you credit. It's wild. That's unfortunate. You need better friends. So let me stop playing. I'm saying though, like they don't even <laughs> give me credit. Is is it just happened like two weeks ago? I was just like, I see no, you though. Perhaps you gotta stop it. Ayo, hey, excuse me, everyone. This was actually originated here. The right. one and only. Yeah, exactly. Um, I love asking this question too. Like, when is the last time that you did something for the first time? Any new experiences? The last time I did something for the first time, I actually try to do that more. Um, try to do that more this year. What was the last thing I did for the first time? Uh, oh, I went um, scuba diving. Okay. I went scuba diving. I've been snorkeling a few times, but mm -hmm. never scuba diving. And so I went scuba diving. That was cool. Like, I was laying on the ocean floor with like a starfish. So that was cool. Oh, nice. So I love that. 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 that was the last new thing I think I've done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I can dig it. I can dig it. Yeah. Last one for the icebreakers. If you weren't the co-founder of the Cut app, is there anything else you could see yourself doing right now? I mean, truthfully, it'd be this, I would have probably started another company. Um, Mm -hmm. I think entrepreneurship was always in my blood, uh, especially like since I was younger. If it wasn't like business, I think I'd probably be working maybe like as a marketer. Okay. Um, and before like uh, like starting to cut, I was working as a software engineer. So like I was building software. So it'd be one of those two. Um, or maybe like my friend said, maybe I'd be a comedian. I don't know. You can do it all though. Software engineer by day or, you know, marketer by day, businessman by day, comedian by night. You know, why not? Why if you got that? many hats in life, right? You can. You can do it all. I love it. So I feel like the thing that I want to start off with with you is this Forbes 30 under 30. Because anytime I see these things, I'm like, why didn't I try to be popping before I was 30? Now I'm over 30. Got like 40 under 40 or something. There's definitely a list. There's absolutely a list. So you definitely set the goal. I, I don't see why not. Got a few more years before that happens. So I need to do something great. I see it in the next year. I, I love that. I love that. From your mouth to God's ears. How did this come about, this Forbes 30 under 30? Um, like I said, uh, honestly, well, to your point, I actually, like coming out of high school, I know this was a goal I wanted. I wanted to make that list at some mm -hmm. point in life. And so I think that probably just like shaped the way I looked at opportunities and what I ended up spending my time on because everything was kind of leading up to or in aspirations to try to make that list, right? Just in whatever yeah. capacity that looked like. Um, how did it actually happen tactically? This was three years into the company, two or three years into the company. We started in 2016. I think it was 2019. We were living in LA and okay. we were in a Techstars program. Um, Techstars is like a tech accelerator. Uh, they take a bunch of startups in to like cohorts and over the course of like a 12 week period, they introduce you to a bunch of mentors and help you kind of refine your business idea and help mm -hmm. you kind of catapult, you know, your catapult you catapult your business in whatever way they can, right? And in that business, in that program, I think one of the mentors we had um, recommended us to the Forbes 30 and 30 because what we learned is that it's all basically done through like recommendations. Okay. So like people, I think they, they their team also looks up people who are doing interesting things, but they also rely heavily on, you know, previous cohorts to do recommendations. And, 
yeah, someone recommended us and we got an interview. We didn't think it was happening, but then we got it. We saw, we woke up like a month later and we saw our names tagged on the internet and we were like, oh shit. It's up. Hardly. <laughs> oh, you're good. Yeah. Like, but it's up from there. When you get yeah, tagged. cool. So, yeah, we we got a couple of, obviously, like a few different articles written about us. Um, I think it, if anything, it's really just like helped as a like qualifier with emails, you know, um, people definitely respond, get higher open rates and response rates now for sure. Absolutely. I feel the same way. Like I just got an award in, in September and I feel like after, re- thank you, after receiving this award, like so many things have just started to happen within like this last month. It's like yeah. insane. I'm like, so y'all ain't seen me before. <laughs> I, well, hey, but well, what my man say, uh, Joe Buck, uh, not, uh, Joey Crack. Yesterday's price is not today's price, right? So once that happens, you know, everything else changes a little bit. It really does. That's that's great to know um, that you had to be recommended. But take me back to like maybe like 2015, maybe 2016 as well, like when you all were about to launch this. Ultimately, what was the inspiration behind wanting to do this app? For sure. I mean, <clears throat> the inspiration was the problem that I'm sure you have had. I have had and so many others have had, right? Where it's you're in a new area, you need a new barber or stylist, and you can't find one. Okay. I had graduated college in 2014. I had moved to Charlotte to start a new job. I had gone nearly two, almost three months without a haircut, which for me is entirely too long. Right. And the issue wasn't that there weren't good barbers. It's just like I had no good way to find them other than like doing a Google search, right? Mm-hmm. And I didn't really feel comfortable enough trusting what I was seeing on Google. And so I delayed it until I found some guy who was recommended to me by uh, somebody I ran to on the street. Uh But um, yeah, like fast forward, like a year later, uh, I moved back home and I'm thinking about that situation because it wasn't like, again, there weren't, it wasn't, there weren't good barbers. I just had no good way to discover them. So I started thinking about like, this is around the same time as you're seeing Airbnb, Uber, Lyft, Handy, and so many apps being built like off the backs of Craigslist. And they were basically turning these kind of like communities into like digital marketplaces and building apps around them. And so I realized you could probably do the same thing for barbers. Uh-huh. Um, fast forward a little bit, a couple more months, I'm starting to work on this idea, like a very early prototype. My co, like my two B co-founders working on another app. Um, we show like our friends, like the early version of our apps, like after playing basketball one day, um, our friends got really excited about my idea. And so well, we ended up showing it to like a couple barbers that we would go to regularly. Uh-huh. And they quickly said this was dope, but then moreover that they had issues running their business, whether it's schedule management, customer management, and trying to like scale. And then mm-hmm. we realized, all right, well, if we put the two together, then we could build a really powerful platform. And here we are seven years later. Yeah, that's, that's, I can see that totally be a, being a thing too. Not only, I just think for us in the beauty industry, like we are very creative, but the business side of things right. is where a lot of people like struggle. So it's no surprise that the barbers were like, yeah, like we need some help with the, the systems, the, the scaling and to grow in the business too. And like, that's actually like one of our earlier, like marketing campaigns. Like it was really around, like you are, everyone in this industry, like you are artisan, like skilled craftsmen right like you are really good at performing amazing haircuts which is like a work of art at times right and our whole thing was like hey, you focus on your craft and we'll handle everything else like we just want you to be better and spend all your time like perfecting the haircut and then we'll handle all the back office stuff that no one likes to do anyway and that was kind of like that's been our business proposition from the jump i love that i love that um what was i going to ask you that i just lost my question oh yes so as far as the earlier version of the app the the earlier version of the app that you showed to your friends <laughs> how does that differ from what you have now <clears throat> tremendously uh <laughs> i am i mean i was a good, i was a good software engineer like just getting started but i was not great my co-founder <laughs> is phenomenal and so he's rebuilt our app from the ground up wow. um, so where is our app today it is a different color scheme, so that's key. Um, features and functionality, it's like night and day. Like we launched with just like bare bones discovery, like being able to search barbers and a barber being able to like manage appointments. And since then we've added payments, a bunch of like features around customer management, uh, appointment management, payment infrastructure. So yeah, the product has evolved tremendously and it yeah. will continue to, but yeah, the very first version, we still have those screenshots up somewhere. 
And it's like one day we'll probably do like a little wall, it's like showing the timeline or something like that. Cool. Like, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Are there a lot of apps like this out? I'm not, of course, I'm not a barber, but right. are there a lot of apps like the Cut app that are out or <clears throat> that were out before you started doing this? Yeah, I think there are definitely people trying to solve the same problem, right? Um, whether it's like on the stylist side or like the barber side, there are people who are trying to introduce like appointment booking software to make your business easier, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there were definitely solutions, but when we came out, we were like one, the main solution that solely focused on barbers, right? When you think about the beauty and barbering space, there's a lot more female-led professions than there mm -hmm. are um, men-led professions. And so our initial like kind of focus and strategy was let's build a brand specifically for barbers in a way that kind of like uh, removes the other noise around their business and amplifies them and makes them feel seen in a way that they hadn't um, before. And mm -hmm. that's how we've been able to grow today is like building our brand specifically focused on barbers, whereas any other players in the space may focus more generally. Our focus has always been kind of on that individual barber and like that has given us kind of like um, our distinction yeah. in the marketplace. Got you. Okay. Okay. How do you go about marketing it to barbers though? Do they feel like this is something that they need to jump on or does it take some persuading? I mean, I think you said it yourself, right? Like a lot of them are like great at doing their job, but need some help on the like system side. And a lot of barbers know that. So I would say even like and this goes like, let's like when I, when I talk to people about like starting a business, like trying to solve a real problem makes your job so much easier because when you're solving a problem, people are looking for solutions, right? Yeah. And so, so many barbers were looking for a solution that like adequately solved like all their like issues. And that was what we came in trying to do, right? We built our app to kind of mirror the experience that barbers had when using the popular social media apps so that they would have a more seamless transition from like, you know, pen and paper to like using an app to run their business. And mm -hmm. then in that, <clears throat> Yeah, I think we've just done a good job at making sure barbers like have the features they want to like, you know, be able to go after their goals and dreams. Yeah. Does it help with customer retention in any kind of way? Like, Absolutely. Kind of repeat customers? Absolutely. We have features that like encourage rebooking so people can book automatically when they're in the seat or when they leave the chair. We have features around like basically barbers can set up their own loyalty program so that like customers can earn discounts on coins at like on cuts after X number of cuts. So yeah, there's a bunch of different features that we will continue to introduce, but uh, our whole thing is like, as long as we get your, get your client in a chair, we want to keep them in there for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is there a cost associated with using the app um, for the consumer or for the, the barber? Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, as a business management tool, barbers pay $20 a month to use the app. And usually like for them, they just don't bat their eye because like our, again, we built the band specifically with barbers. So what that's allowed us to do is on the customer side, we built the brand that we are the barber app. And so now when people are looking for barbers, they come to us first. And that means that we're driving more new clients to barbers. And so when barbers use our app and they get like one or two or three new clients a month or a week, they just like don't even think about how much they got to pay, you know, monthly. Right. And yeah, yeah. so that's kind of like kind of how we do our pricing. Gotcha, gotcha. I love that. That's very affordable. Y'all better hop on this. I know a lot of barbers too, so I'm about to tell them all about this. If Definitely. they're not using it already. Please do it. If y'all need extra help getting set up, please let me know. We'll be happy to give you the, my own personal walkthrough, get you all squared away. I love that. Aside from the value that it provides for the barbers, it's like from the client standpoint, what is the value that they receive from using the app? A couple of things. I mean, I'm sure like myself, you hate just walk into a stylist or barber shop and you got to wait two, three hours before you're seen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you hate like not being able to find somebody last minute when your person canceled on you. All right. So there, these are some of the key things that we like, we saw, right? Like with the cut as a customer, you can schedule your appointment at your own convenience, whether you're at work, at home, whenever you whenever you have the time, you can book your barber and then know when I schedule this two o'clock appointment on next Tuesday, when I show up at two o'clock, it's my turn to sit in the seat, right? We allow you to pay your barber using the app too. So you don't have to worry about cash anymore, trying to like go run to an ATM before your service. And you know, like I said, we allow you to rebook appointments. We make it easier for you to kind of like save photos of like 
your past cut or haircuts you want. So that way you can show your barber. So it's an easier communication of what you're looking for. That mm -hmm. way there's no miscommunication that you're at the end of the haircut pissed because it's not, it didn't come out right. right. Um, yeah. There, yeah, those are the kind of things that we that we're working on for customers. Gotcha. I like that. Do you recommend that the barbers that use this app use this app solely as their their booking system? Um, so there's not any confusion or you know, mixed up calendars and such. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's what we'll even start to see is that because you can't, to your point, you can't kind of have two running calendars unless they know what's going on in each calendar, right? Because I've a, I've a if I'm booking a two o'clock appointment on the cut, but you take an appointment somewhere else, somewhere else, my else books at two, now it's an issue. So, yeah, we definitely encourage all barbers to use us exclusively. But even without our encouragement, we see barbers say, hey, I'm not taking appointments from you unless you book me on the cut. So a lot of barbers are kind of doing it, doing it themselves. Got you. Because I asked that question because my best friend, she has locks too, but she had, she has been having the hardest time finding a loctician so maybe maybe we could collab on a, a lock app absolutely okay? i mean i'm down look we even got locticians on the cut today like we found we got stylists using the cut we got locticians using the cut because it kind of just works the same running your business but yeah let's definitely talk happy to help all my you know my lock brothers and sisters out there you know happy to help yeah she was like having a hard time but then when she finally scheduled with this girl the girl had to cancel the appointment because she didn't block off um her calendar correctly and I was like you know she was asking me my opinion about it and I was like I was like it happens like it definitely happens sometimes but if it's like a, a thing like that's always happening that's her excuse then I probably wouldn't just go to her I just choose somebody else and I would say like one of the benefits barbers tell us is that like because they use like an app like ours it's forced them to be more accountable right and so like it's, uh, it's allowed them to like level up their business to the point where like they don't do these type of things anymore because it's you know it doesn't it doesn't bode well for the customer right and then now like i have a negative opinion of you so yeah i think the more barbers start to use services like this or styles or electricians like the better you will be at running your business and the more your customers will appreciate it yeah yeah so as far as building this network of barbers that you have now how do you know how many like barbers are in the cut app now for sure. I mean, we've signed up over, well, I'll say this. There are over 15,000 barbers around the country who use us every month. 15,000. Okay, so where did you, or when did you see, like, the biggest amount of growth? Like, when you first started in the beginning, or is it just, like, a gradual, like, growth over the years? I mean, I say the combination. <laughs> I would say definitely been a gradual bit of growth over the last few years. I'd say the other thing driving, or the other big driver of growth is the pandemic. Uh, okay. Obviously, like when the first pandemic happened, everyone was locked in the crib, so you couldn't leave out the house. Um, but when states started to gradually reopen their local, like various like businesses, barbers, stylists, and salons were like some of the first businesses opened again, right? And in doing that. The lot of the states required that barbers and stylists they use software like the cut because it allowed them to do a couple things one um, contract tracing two allowed to mitigate the number of people in the shop and then three around um, moving away from cash and introducing digital payments so the pandemic for us ended up being like another like uh, surge of growth but to your like really to your question it's kind of been gradual through the years gotcha that is that is very um, that is fantastic. 15,000, y'all. Don't get a mistake for 1,500. We talk about 15,000. That is that is great. What I wanted to know, too, about the network is, since you do have this network of 15,000, is there a way to vet them in a way, or is it just based off of whoever signs up? Do you Are you privy to the quality of the barbers, I would say? So when Whether they work and the person. We do our, our best to empower customers to make the decision that is best for them. So like we require as much information as we can from barbers, you know, the type of location, residential, commercial, 
their services, their prices, their photos and haircuts. We have our refuse system so people can leave reviews. And we try to give it, we try to surface as much information as possible for the customer so that they can make the decision. Because to your point, like we have so many barbers that we can't manually vet every single barber signing up. Like mm-hmm. 3,000 barbers a month sign up for the cut. So we can't vet every single barber, but we can do as much as we can to provide you information. And like we're thinking through ways that we can better verify them, you know, down the road. But mm-hmm. yeah, with that information, customers are able to then find a barber, look through their reviews and say, all right, this is the guy I want or the gal I want and, you know, schedule their appointment and get their cut. This is so cool. So are you doing this full time? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Like this is, like, how do you get paid from this? Like I'm, I'm intrigued. I want an app now. <laughs> I'm good. No, for sure. Uh, I mean, two ways. Like I said, my barbers pay monthly, right? So barbers pay a monthly fee to use the app. And then we also make money on transactions. So like, just like when you use a lot of other payment processors, um, there's a fee associated with transactions. And those are the two ways at which we drive revenue to that. Can we do a lock app? I'm down. Let's talk. Look, whoever's listening to this, don't be trying to do it before we do it. <laughs> like, let us get it off the ground first. Let us get it off the ground. Let us try it out first. Let us like do our thing. Okay. Um, You did mention earlier that you kind of had like an entrepreneurial spirit or you grew up very entrepreneurial. What other kind of endeavors did you dabble in before the cut app? (laughs) For sure. A couple of different things. Uh, (laughs) My very first job, I was 14. I was selling newspapers. Um, That was like 13, 14. That was like my first job. So I would say... That was the very first time like I started working for my own self. Mm-hmm. Uh, in high school, I used to sell candy, uh, hit up Costco, we get the you know bundle pack, get back to the school. Uh, yeah, like ever since then, I've, I've always known I wanted to start my own business, and it was more like finding what the right opportunity looked like. Before the cut, like the very first app I built was more for like <clears throat> financial planning. So for you as someone who's working a job, um, you know your salary or you know how much you get paid hourly and you input this information to the app and we can kind of like forecast how much you should save um, and what that will compound to over time so that you can help plan for retirement. So those are some of the early things that I was working on. But yeah, like I've always, like I said, wanted to like, my whole thing has always been around solving problems. I know I've always like solving problems for people and, you know, usually, you know, do that in a business format. So that's yeah. kind of where I've been at. Yeah, where are you from? Uh, I mean, I grew up in Atlanta. Well, let me not say that. I was born in Atlanta. I moved up to like this DMV area when I was in, like middle school, and so I've been here for like twenty years now. So, like gotcha. Georgia, made Virginia, we're fine. You know what I mean, yeah. So you're from Maryland? Uh, VA, 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 VA. 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 Okay, VA. I can always tell when people are not from DC because they say DMV. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm gonna be MBA, yeah, because yeah. we don't, I mean, you know, right. DC is DC, you know, and you know, everyone got their own culture, so you know, I definitely yeah. be sure, you know, we within the DMV diameter radius, yeah, you yeah. know. Are you first generation here? I am. My parents um, immigrated from Nigeria, and then yeah, we my all my siblings are first gen here in the states. Yeah. Yeah, how does how do you think that affects how you approach um, business and entrepreneurial entrepreneurship? <clears throat> I would say, if anything, it kind of, it it gives you more confidence that it's probably possible, right? Because a lot of time, a lot of immigrants come here, you know, to start anew um, on their own, and then you know entrepreneurship is a way for them to, you know, generate revenue or a means of income because they're not able to do, uh, get other types of jobs at times. Um, I would say for me, like a lot of my uncles and a lot of my uncles already kind of run their own businesses like abroad. And so Mm -hmm. I've always seen entrepreneurship in my life. I would say that's probably how it um, framed it for me. But yeah, I think this is, yeah, I I would say, yeah. Uh, Hey, I have a serious question for you. You trust me, right? Yes? I heard you say yes, right? You heard them say yes, right? Okay, listen. If you said yes and you have a product or service-based business that you want to expose to a loyal and engaged audience, then consider letting me share your business here on the Friends of Beauty podcast. Studies have shown that podcast listeners tend to trust the host, making the advertising messages more authentic and credible. And my favorite part, which a lot of people don't know, is the longevity. 
Unlike traditional ads that have a limited lifespan and disappear after your budget has been exhausted, my podcast episodes are available indefinitely. This means that your ad will continue to reach new listeners long after the initial episode airs. And you already know my consistency is off the chain. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. And as the Friends of Beauty podcast continues to grow, your brand will continue to reach a new audience. That's how it works here. So don't wait any longer. I want to expose your brand to my Friends of Beauty. All you have to do is click the link below with all of the details and we can make it happen. Anyways, let's go ahead and get back to the episode. So your family didn't have any problems with you um, pursuing like software engineering or anything? Well, software engineering, no. But starting my own business, yes. Yeah. Um, definitely had many a conversations about whether or not, when it was the right time to quit my job. Definitely had several conversations about that. When did you quit your job? Sooner than I told them I would. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Uh, I was working at the time. And I knew we, we had started working on like the early prototype. And I had set a goal. I think I'd said, if we get to the first 10,000 users, once we get to our 10, first 10,000 users, I would kind of like, quit my job and then, you know, work on this full time. Uh, before then, I had built up a list of 10,000, like, barbers via just, like, going through Instagram, looking at barbers who were like, yo, DM me for appointments, text me for appointments, and just mm-hmm. built, like, a list, a spreadsheet of all these barbers. And, like, that was, like, how we initially launched. We reached out to all of them, like, yo, this now exists. Um, come check us out. Um, and so that was kind of where I got the 10,000. Once you get the 10,000 barbers, and I'll quit. And we did this. We launched. I I think in the first month, we got to, like, a 1,000 and some change, and I quit. I said, fuck it. This is this. <laughs> That was enough. That, that was enough of a proof point for me. Right. He was like a thousand. Okay, I'm out of here. I mean, like it was. I seen the signs, the early signals, and yeah, ever since then, it's just been up. I mean, yeah, for sure. But I definitely think having like strong goals, because uh, like it'll help frame kind of how you think about it. But yeah, absolutely. Did you feel like you were ready when you quit? Yeah. You I, were. I, I'm also very fortunate. Again, like, let me take a step back. I was in a position where I could quit. Because at the time I had moved back in to live with my folks. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that was a caveat that had I not been living with my folks, I definitely would have um, further stuck to my goal and target until we had reached a certain level of like, you know, revenue generation that to sustain us as a business. Yeah. But because I had like the, the ability to like move back in with my parents, I was able to, you know, cheat a little bit on that goal. Yeah. And what kind of work were you doing before you said? I was working as a software engineer. Um, so I, I had just started working at Accenture. Oh, okay. And I was like working on some of their projects. My niece, uh, I think she still works for Accenture. She had gotten a really good, um, she went through the Year Up program. Mm. Got an internship with Accenture and then they created a role for her. And she's love been, that. I think, rocking with them ever since. Yeah, I love Accenture. They were a great place to work. Uh, great, and like the cohort of like um, other like students, I guess, turned uh, early employees that we came in with i'm still cool with today i think they do a really good job of recruiting um so yeah i'm a big fan of essential yeah when you were um reaching out to those ten thousand barbers were you doing that yourself like ban- manually or did you have like a va or something oh, no, absolutely myself like i mean but we we leveraged it to make it easier right like i said i built the list myself during <laughs> during work hours right um <laughs> I built the list myself as, on my off time as well uh, lunch breaks mainly um and then, yeah, like we, we basically kind of like we built some software, like I don't want to say software, but like we use like existing software solutions that allowed us to kind of like send out mass text messages. So like okay. some CRM tools. So like we were able to, you know, reach out to everybody that we like built list of. But yeah, a lot of the work we did for the first few years was done like internally by myself and my co-founder. I love that. I love the, the, the groundwork, like the hands on getting your hands dirty. No other way. I feel like you gotta. I mean, you gotta really get down to the ground if you want to make some make something happen. Now, are you loyal to your barber, or do you kind of bounce around? <laughs> Absolutely, I'm loyal to my barber. But I mean, me and my barber go watch this, so you gotta say that for sure. I mean, but me and my barber have an open relationship, and it is understood. <laughs> um, I feel like you know, with, I travel a lot, and my barber is busy, and like my barber will like will get booked out like weeks in advance. 
And so, like, I, think I, I can get on the schedule if I need to, right? But at the same time, like, I have other people I can go to, whether it's locally or, like, when I'm traveling. Um, oh. But, yeah, no, nah, like, I definitely have my main barber. Um, okay. But you know, I got a couple that I can go to in an emergency situation. Yeah. So with building this app, even though you have the background in software engineering, what were like some of the earlier obstacles that you had to overcome, like technical wise with the app? Uh, so, I mean, the biggest obstacles earlier on is just kind of like how quickly we were able to roll out features and functionality. Um, it was just myself and my co-founder in the early days. So we just the two of us and he was the one building the app and I was doing everything else. So like it would just take us time to get features out. We would roll them out like one platform at a time. So like iPhone users would get something and then Android users would get like three months later. Um, that was something that we had to work through. Um, whether just like bugs when it came to scaling, you know, how to properly scale the system infrastructure to manage like user growth. Um, we saw some issues there. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd say like, <laughs> There were like times in our early days when we would like go to lunch um, and we would like roll out a release of like something and go to lunch. And then we would be at lunch and like our emails would get flooded um, by support requests because like something made have broke and like the app wasn't working. And mm -hmm. this was like when we first realized that like we'd actually like built something people cared about. Because people would be like blown over in by like, yo, I can't run my business. Like you guys are ruining my life. And it was like, yo, what? <laughs> My bad, like, we'll get right back into it. So, yeah, no, nah, we've definitely had a few uh, hiccups and bumps along the road. Dang. So what does the, okay, so I'm a techie at heart. I like to tell people that I have an IT degree that I never got to use. And I was really into like programming and stuff like that. So I really, I'm really interested in like the back end. Like, what does this look like on the back end? And how are you, like, what kind of programs are you using to develop the app? Absolutely. Uh, so... Each app is built natively, which means it's like built for the specific kind of iPhone or uh, iPhone. It's built specifically for the phone it's being used on. Like some apps today are built via cross-platform solutions, which means like you can build an app or design it in one place and it'll make an iOS and an Android version. Okay. The difference is sometimes you kind of lose out on some of the features and functionality that like iPhone or Android devices have built specifically for like their phones. And so we decided we wanted to build our app native for every platform. So for iOS, we use um, Swift is the, the like a programming language for how we build our iOS apps. And that is done using Xcode, which is um, the iOS program that allows you to write software to build apps. Mm -hmm. uh, for Android, the Android app is built in was the Android Studio, which is a, the same name for like Xcode, which is like the place where you build Android apps. Mm -hmm. So that's the platform that we use to build the apps. Um, what else do we use? We use AWS or Amazon for kind of all of our data hosting and web services. Uh, we use some, like we use a, uh, a service called Metabase. Uh, that is kind of where we build our dashboards for analytics. Like, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a collection of different tools in, um, ac across the stack, but yeah, all of them come to life to help make the app a yeah. little bit. This is this is really cool. So how like expense wise, how much does it cost you every month to keep the app up and running? <laughs> nice a nice pretty penny for sure. <laughs> a nice pretty penny. Especially now when we have a team. Um definitely a nice pretty penny. A nice pretty yeah. penny. Like in the five figures? For sure. Okay. For, for sure. Um like if you're speaking specifically just like the software to keep the business alive. Yeah, it's definitely in the mid in the five figures for sure. Definitely. Wow. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, one thing I do want to talk to you about is um just centered around the the two events that I've attended so far, uh, yeah. sponsored by the Cut app, Thank and just sure. about this decision that the Board of Education has made pertaining to financial aid. Can you share a little bit more about what is actually like what that decision was and how it's going to affect like barbers and cosmetologists going forward? Absolutely. So this is essentially what's happening in a nutshell. Um, in an attempt to kind of better be stewards, to be better stewards of the money that the government is making available to students, mm -hmm. the Department of Education is reviewing a bunch of the 
secondary educational programs that they fund via financial aid and analyzing whether or not the students graduating from these programs are earning a livable wage or even enough to pay back the loan that they're taking out, right? Mm -hmm. And so the whole kind of initiative is driven around making sure there's more transparency in the programs people are applying for, whether it's nursing, barbering, Cosmo, making sure you understand kind of what graduation rates look like and what um, your expected earning income will look like post-graduation so that you can make the decision of whether or not you actually want to invest this money into this program. So that's essentially what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the caveat there is the data that they're using to make some of the decisions is flawed or kind of lacking, right? And that's why we and so many in the space got involved is because based on kind of the the guidelines they've set, there could be hundreds of barbering Cosmo programs that are being subject to potentially closure because they don't meet the established like earning threshold. Now, yeah. the issue is that when we look at our data and we talk to other barbers and we talk to other staffs on the program, they are making way more than the, what, $19,000 that the DOE says is kind of like that minimum threshold, right? And so when they're saying that as a new student graduating, you're only making call it 18, 19,000, that's not enough to um, pay back the loans they're taking out. It's not enough to like live a life. And they don't want the government to be putting you on the hook to now take out this loan and now you have to pay the government to, for money you couldn't afford. And so right. our whole thing is that, look, <clears throat> We understand it. it makes a ton of sense. We think everyone should have as much information as possible. Empowerment is what's driven us, right? But when it comes to barbering and cosmos, you guys don't have enough like perfect information. And we want to help provide that information, right? And so that was kind of the, that was what um, our involvement around the initiative is like how do we help get you the information that you need so that you guys can like properly, um, you know, identify programs that are actually lacking and leave the ones that are performing well alone. And hopefully we can like become a part of their decision-making matrix. But if not, kind of like at our most recent event, we've introduced our The Cut Scholarship, which will be for Barbara and Cosmo students. And yeah, I mean, our, our whole goal here is to help as many as we can. And, you know, for every student, like, you know, we'll commit our scholarship is $5,000 to going towards your barbering or Cosmo tuition. And yeah, every quarter we will look to award that. And hopefully we, hopefully we can make a difference for any people who no longer have access to financial aid. Yeah, I love I love the idea of the scholarship. When I saw that the other day, I was like, this is so cool. And it's so I love attending and seeing stuff like that because it's so aspirational for, you know, the support that I want to be able to provide one day for, you know, friends and beauty as well. Absolutely. But for as far as the Board of Education, so are they saying that if they deem that cosmetology or barbering is a field that will not allot you the money to pay back the loan, then they will not be providing financial aid towards those type of programs? Exactly that. So like certain barbering colleges and schools, if you show like um, continued uh, low earning for graduating mm -hmm. classes, then this program would no longer be eligible to offer financial aid. And so then you could see a bunch of closures of barbering schools and barbering programs, which now makes it harder for barbers to get licensed. And so now you just have potentially a bunch of barbers who are not licensed running around, or you just have less barbers running around, which, you know, now makes costs go up for everybody else. So, man, yeah, mm -hmm. end in time, so. Yeah. And we already know, we know the real, like barbers are out here. I know a lot of six figure in like, up, up like barbers. Right. And I ain't even trying to be in nobody's pockets, but 100%, like barbers, I, they're barbers definitely, like even on our platform, we can tell you today that barbers make more than what is the U.S. national median income. Now, obviously that like varies on location, but like to say that barbers and new students, like new barbering students don't make enough, I think is crazy. And yeah, our whole thing is like, how do we continue to work with the DOE and any other like legislative body on, you know, becoming again, our whole thing is we don't want to stop your decision making because we understand that like, the premise and why it's valuable. We just yeah. want to make sure you have all the right information so that you can make the right decision. Yeah, because this this um, student loan thing is out of control. I was fortunate enough to not have to get student loans because I paid out of pocket for school. I went to UDC and it was like really, really cheap at the time. Okay. Um, but I have so many friends who are like drowning in student loan debt. So hopefully that that decision will translate to other industries too and not just like you know barbering and cosmetology but 
since that's the industry that we are in, I can totally see how that can affect people because most people don't have that type of money to just pay out of pocket to pursue those careers. But, and yet you still need a certification in order to legally, you know, perform yeah, those roles. Exactly. It's like a cash 22. And so your yeah. whole thing is that like, we think it's somewhat unfair and we want to do our part, whatever that looks like to make sure like anyone who gets caught up in this crossfire that we can help, you know, like you said, any other aspirations around this field. Yeah. Aside from donating to the scholarship that you have, how how do you suggest other barbers or people in the beauty industry can get involved um, with this and kind of sway their the decision that they may make? Sure. Unfortunately, like they the deal we had kind of like a live petition um, that was like open on the website for a lot of people to ring responses. That's closed now. It was a couple months ago. Um, but I would just say as barbers, just being involved in the decisions being made at like your at your local like um, board of barbers in your various states. Uh, I mean, yeah, and it's just like, you know, the more awareness is made that I think the more um, can be heard by the decision makers. Um, mm -hmm. And that was like our big thing is like when we started our petition, um, just so many barbers weren't even aware that this was happening and barbering colleges weren't even aware this was happening. And then now that all of them know, like we wish we had some, we, we, I mean, I'd say Canley, we wish we were able to like um, start our campaign or push earlier so that we can have even have more of an effect. So I think that could have um, helped, right? But yeah, I think staying as aware of what's going on in the industry is the biggest thing that anyone can do. Yeah, because I could, I could see this being like a really big ripple effect, like from the bottom up, like, if the if the schools don't know about it, then eventually they're going to be wondering like, why is our enrollment so low? And now we got to let go teachers, and now we got to close down the school because we can't sustain, you know. Everything downstream definitely has an effect, and yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So what I mean, what are we going to do? Like I said, we have our scholarship. We're going to be exploring other ways in which we could potentially help, um, whether it's like the cut providing financial aid too to some effect, but. Yeah, like there are things that we are exploring as opportunities to help, you know, bolster the inner industry in any way we can. Yeah, we love to see it. We love to see it. So at the end of the day, Obi, like what do you envision your legacy being with the Cut app in particular and with the work that you're doing for advocating for us in this industry? Absolutely. I mean, with the Cut, our big goal is to build like the largest barbering brand that's ever existed, right? Um, when you think Ulta, you think Sephora, we want to do the same thing for barbering, right? Give people a brand they know that's global, and that means barbering. Uh, barbering is culture. Uh, it is our culture. It's been in our communities for decades and millennia, right? And we think there's a lot of, um, call it, aspects to that experience that could be transformed in the 21st century. So our big goal is like to build a large global brand that amplifies the impact of barbers both in the shop and outside the shop. And yeah, every day we, we wake up, we come to the office and we try to make that happen. I can't wait to see it say 1 million plus users. Like that's gonna be. Uh, well, today we technically have um, 6 million or just about 6 million users around the country. Six million users. And that's just like in like that encompasses like the clients and the barbers. Exactly. See, I didn't even ask you about the clients that, that are on there using it. You said 15,000 barbers, but like. 15,000 barbers every month are booking appointments and uh, just about a million of clients actually are booking appointments every quarter. So today about a million clients are booking appointments every quarter. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it's just been hustling and grinding ever since 2016 to build this thing. Every day, you know, a new problem, a new issue, a new opportunity. And yeah, I mean, we, we, we love meeting incredible people like yourself who like allow us to tell our story and share our story, like meeting incredible barbers who help like amplify our message. And yeah, like I think you were asking earlier, like, how do we grow? Like when we survey our barbers today, like half of our barbers tell us that they heard about the cut from another barber. So mm -hmm. Yeah, we just continue to really try to build this brand and like organically carry us forward. Yeah. Any um any plans on how you can provide like continued education for the barbers or create some kind of in person environment for them too? Like bring them off of the app and then like meet in person, have like a shindig. Absolutely. 
Um, mm-hmm. We're always talking about ways that we can do events, whether it's a, like barber, co- like barbering, like events or expos. We'll bring in our barbers and like allow them like have like mixers and stuff like that. Um, in terms of continuing education, uh, we currently have like a suite of like what we call like un- the Cut University. It's like uh, videos that kind of like give barbers the MBA, right? That they need to run a business or helping them, teaching them like a lot of the business that goes along with the barbering. Yeah. So we definitely have plans to kind of evolve that in the future. But yeah, our like, empowerment is key for us. So any which way that we can help our barbers be better at what they do, um, that's, that's on our to-do list. Yeah. And do you cut by any chance? Do you. I am not a barber, unfortunately. I'm just a client who, who, who had struggles. But I, I do plan on actually going to barber school um, in the near future. Okay. Um, but yeah, I currently do not. Do I think I can give you a haircut? Probably not. But I could probably give you a nice little shape up. I think I can give somebody a shape up. I can give somebody okay. a shape up. Okay. Or even Steven, that, that term that we learned. I can do even, even Steven. Yeah, I mean, I can do an even Steven, nice little, you know I mean, shape sharp line. <laughs> I love it. Is there anything that's coming up next for you in the cut app that you can share? For sure. I mean, we have a bunch of different things. Um, we recently just launched our first iteration of kind of like our Groom's Day giveaway. And this is going to be something that's going to be launching like four times a year. And okay. essentially for weddings, um, we're launching kind of like a, a wedding day suite experience for the groom and the groom's women. And mm-hmm. so we're partnering with a few different brands. We'll have our barber pull up, give out free haircuts. Um, and then creating like a, a dope like experience for the groom the day of. So I'm super excited about that and how that evolve in the future. Um, we got some new features coming out, um, the functionality. But yeah, no, we, we definitely got a few things cooking up. I think that that groom thing is going to be a huge hit. Yeah, agreed. Because uh, I, I feel like grooms some of the somewhat overlooked, you know, when it comes to weddings. And so if we can just you know use that time to make them feel a little extra special. Why not? Yeah, some kind of pampering experience because some of them, you know, they might be loyal to their barbers already. Right. But some kind of experience because I always joke. Anytime I had to do a wedding, I'm always joking with the women. Like we're up at like six o'clock in the morning or something yeah, super oh, early. Here, absolutely. And I'm like the dudes are over there taking shots, playing basketball, <laughs> getting sweaty. If they take a shower and walk down the aisle, and we over here getting all glammed, so they need to be doing something to I'm, get ready too. I'm weak. No, I definitely. We don't have, we, see, if anything, I want to at least get them scheduled early, start the haircuts early, at least they schedule for the haircuts. Um, but yeah, like we definitely think there's an opportunity to create an experience here. Yes, yes. Wow. This has been, a, I've learned so much um, just talking to you within this short amount of time. So I can only imagine if we had more time to ch- chit chat, but we got to connect again soon. Before I let you go though, Obi, I have to ask you the friends and beauty rapid fire questions. All right. All right. Okay. I'm ready. So I know you'll be great at this. Whatever comes to your mind first, spit it out. If you need to elaborate, you know, you can, Okay. but this is the first one. So the first one is look at that. I love the, the seriousness that comes over people's faces <laughs> when they hear about this. Anyway, I, I, I got to lock in. I got to lock in, you know, lock in. All right. First one, what are the top three keys to your success so far? Uh, top three. Um, I wake up early. Um, I, and by, by wake up early, I, I mean, I start my day, I start working early. Um, I work a lot. I've sacrificed a lot of things for work. And I think I have, um, I, I am a very optimistic person. I think anything is possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, that's two. Is that three? Was that three? That was three. So you wake up early, you're optimistic. Oh, and then uh, I'm, I won't say I'm petty, but if you tell me I can't do something, I'll prove that I can't do it. And so I would say that, um, that I guess, chip on the shoulder has driven me forward. Okay, I can do it. Okay, I guess, what's that? Um, what do they call it? Imposter syndrome. There you go. That's that's what it, I'll, I'll throw that in there. Okay, I like it. How do you measure your success? The impact that we're able to have. So, like the number of barbers that we're able to help, like grow their business. Um, that's how I impact my success. That's how I view my success. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. What's the best advice you've ever received, or a piece of advice that just always sticks with you? Uh. What I mentioned earlier around, uh, well, I didn't say this, but being a vitamin versus being like a painkiller. 
Mm-hmm. And it's more around kind of like, what I'm talking about solving a problem. When you think about a vitamins, vitamins are like nice to have, right? They make things a little bit better, but they're not like, they're not mission critical. But when you think about a painkiller, it's because it's something that you absolutely need because you're in excruciating pain. And so thinking about um, solving problems that people need, like a solution for, has been what like, is something that continues to guide me when I think about like businesses or like strategies, because again, like I said earlier, if people need it, they're actively searching for a solution. And that makes your job that much easier because the hardest part of any business growing is scaling and marketing and acquisition, right? It's expensive, it takes a lot of work. And so if you can do, if you can make your job half as easy because people are seeking you out and you are easily discoverable, then, you know, your business is that much better, so, yeah. Okay, I love it. What advice would you give to another entrepreneur right now who is like in the startup phase, they're experiencing a lot of challenges and they're just like, I'm just ready to give up. I'm about to go back to work. Uh, perseverance is, I mean, that's an easy one to give you. Um, I would say, yeah, I mean, push through. Like there were several times um, over the last six, seven years where I felt like, yo, should we keep doing this? Like, is this worth our time? We waste the last few years. And I mean, the highs come with the lows. So, you know, every time there's a low, there's probably a high coming if you think about peaks and valleys. And so, yeah, I would just say perseverance is key. But I mean, that's what everyone's going to tell you, but yeah. Uh, perseverance now like someone who hasn't started i would just say just do it and learn along the way like i would say okay i I lied to you (laughs) perseverance the one fact or enough fact um piece of advice i would say is always make sure whatever you're doing you're designing it in a way that can be experiments think about everything you do in the experiment right and think about everything you do as an opportunity to learn because the the like the biggest value that you have or that you can create for yourself is the amount of information or knowledge that you have that no one else has, because then you are able to make better decisions about how to like scale your business. And so the more you're able to test things and learn and use that information to like effectively scale. Yeah. I would just say that would be my biggest piece of advice is like, think about everything you're doing as an experiment, test often, learn often, and like bake that into the DNA of you and your org is like, make sure you're thinking through everything as like as much as possible. Yeah, I love that advice. I I do a lot of experiments. So that's why I'm smiling. Like I I I always say this is this is an experiment. So and then also so that I won't emotionally get too like caught up in it as well. If it doesn't, you know, work out, it's an experiment. Exactly. It's like doing a science experiment. And that's probably a good way for people to look at it when they're scared because you know a lot of times we do things like we're, we're creative, we're passionate, like we our emotions get involved and like if people don't receive it a certain way, a certain way. And so I think if you just like frame it as all experiments, that way to your point, you do, you can probably take emotions a little bit out of it. And you know, this is what the people want. You gotta give the people what the people want. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What is a resource that helps you in your business that you can share with the friends and beauty community? ChatGPT. I'm a, that's an easy one. How are you using ChatGPT? <laughs> so many ways. Uh, I mean, the whole company uses it now. Like our engineers are using it to help them write code, to unblock them when they're building the app. Like on the business side, we use it to help us come up with copy ideas. Like when we're drafting emails, we use it for research. Um, you can use it to like look up information. Um, so yeah, as a like, if you're not using some form of AI, it's like you should definitely be using AI tools. Now, if we're not talking about like ChatGPT and AI, I would say. Notion is okay. kind of our all-in-one super app. We use it as like our business company wiki. So like all the information you need about the company is also here, but we also use it as like our project management tool. So it's a very robust tool. Um, yeah, so shout out to Notion. Yeah, Notion and Chat GPT. Okay, I love it. So the last one, I just want you to fill in the blank for me and just say my name is blank and... The key to longevity and success is whatever you think it is personally. <laughs> My name is Obi, and the keys to longevity and success are finding things that make you happy that people will pay you for. I like that. Find things that make you happy that people will pay you for. 
I love that advice. Before you go, please share like whatever information you want to share in order for people to connect with you, download the app, uh, donate to the scholarship, whatever you want to share. Absolutely. Definitely. Check out our website, all the information you need for the scholarship and more. The iOS app and Android app are available on both stores. So if you need a barber or someone you know needs a barber, or if you just want to see who's around, definitely check out the app. And yeah, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff at the Cut app. And you know, like, subscribe, all that good jazz. Awesome. Thank you so much, Obi. This has been great. And I wish you continued success with all of your endeavors. Absolutely. No, thank you so much for having me, Friends and Beauty, the whole community. Hope you guys had a great time listening and yeah, love to be back anytime. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Friends in Beauty podcast. Don't forget, sharing is caring. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with another friend in beauty. Give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Rate and leave a five-star review so that other friends in beauty can find the show. Plus, we'd love to hear your feedback. Connect with us on all social media platforms at Friends in Beauty. Hashtag Friends in Beauty to join the conversation. And join our Friends in Beauty Facebook community to stay connected. Talk to you soon.